election had the lowest turnout since European parliamentary elections were first begun in 1979. Only 28% of eligible voters bothered to take a ballot. So we're not talking about a big turnout. So you have absenteeism, right-wing populism, all signs of anger, confusion, and above all, mistrust of the establishment. But basically what you have here is the left had what would seem to have been a golden opportunity to move forward, but they somehow failed to capture the popular imagination. Now I'd like to look in turn at the three principal main tendencies on the European left. That is to say, the Social Democrats on the one hand, the Greens on the other hand, maybe charitable referring to as the left current, but that's how they're often considered, and what's called the, the far left. So when I talk about social democracy, I'm talking about the British Labour Party, I'm talking about the French Socialist Party, I'm talking about the German SPD, I'm talking about the Labour Party uh, in, in the Netherlands, uh, the Socialist Workers Party of Spain, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Members, more or less, of what's called the Socialist International. And so they're self-identified as part of this trend. Now, how best can we understand where they really stand in European politics? Well, again, I'll turn, perhaps quirkily, but to another English author, Charles Dickens. In the very first line of his famous novel, The Christmas Carol, Dickens starts by saying, and I quote, Marley was dead to begin with. There was no doubt about that. Old Marley was as dead as a doornail. Now, I think the proper way of looking at European social democracy at this point is to substitute social democracy for old Marley. I'm arguing that social democracy is in its death throes as it has been constituted. Doesn't mean it can't reinvent itself. Political processes, political parties do that all the time. But as it has traditionally stood from World War II to the present, it no longer is a viable project. Now why is that? Well, in the post-World War II context, social democratic parties were able to wrestle real concessions from the bourgeoisie. National health care, Americans may have heard of that, uh, but Europeans have it. Shorter hours, Europeans work far fewer hours than Americans. Average European worker works like something like 1,600 hours a year, depending on which country, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, average American worker, depending on what industry and so on, works about 2,000. Japanese workers work even more. But the point is we're talking about real benefits were achieved by these social democratic parties. Now why was that? Well, the European capitalist class, the bourgeoisie, if you were, had been tremendously weakened by the war. Not just by the war itself, after all, it's a bit hard when Volkswagen finds all its manufacturing facilities completely destroyed by intensive saturation bombing by the Allies. But also weakened by the collaboration with fascism. That is to say, there was more than a whiff, there was a very strong smell of fascism around many of the most venerable and important corporations that made up uh, European capitalism. This was a great weakness. Furthermore, given what happened with the partisan movement, particularly in France and Italy, given what happened with Tito and Yugoslavia, albeit a sort of distant example, there was a very real fear that some sort of revolution might be possible. So therefore, the bourgeoisie was willing to make concessions to social democratic elected governments in the hopes of buying off the common people so they would not turn to more drastic action. And of course, looming over European capitalism, like a bad nightmare, was the fact that the Soviet Union was there to the east. And regardless of what you think of the Soviet Union, good, bad, or indifferent, the fact is the Soviet Union was seen as a competitor, as something that European capitalists had to worry about because 
They didn't want their workers to look to it for a model. They didn't want them to succeed, so on and so forth. But we're now in the 21st century. In the last 20 years, you have a new generation of bourgeois who have arisen up untainted, unafraid, Second World Wars, distant history. They're not afraid of working class insurrection because they don't see it as a possibility. They're unconcerned by what Trotsky called the legacy of October because with the collapse of the Soviet Union, they don't see there's any legacy there. So basically what they've been able to do is regain their confidence and go on the counteroffensive, proclaim this sort of free market uh, fundamentalism. So the Ayatollahs of finance capital have pushed for a return to the 18th century in terms of free markets. Now I should point out parenthetically here, free market means massive government bailouts for the corporations, preferential tariffs, countless subsidies by politicians and local entities. But free market in the sense of weakened trade unions, weakened social benefits, tremendous competition among the masses for jobs, and so on. Now, what was the response to social democracy? Well, having developed what seemed to be a successful strategy of working within the system and getting concessions, they found themselves without a strategy, without a hope, because they accepted the long-term validity of capitalism, and they accepted society's rule by the market. Once they did that, they lost any sort of independent oppositional stance that could have given them a way of retooling and fighting this onslaught. So instead, they wound up, for whatever left rhetoric might have still hung around their conventions, trying just to manage the neoliberal capitalist onslaught. So many of the worst cuts and worst programs and so on such so Germany with the Hartz reforms uh, were instituted by social democrats. Germany, the Hartz reforms, the SPD, uh, cutting back on labor rights, and so on. So the context that came out of World War II that made social democracy a vital, viable project based on reforms within the capitalist system, by the 21st century has rendered it basically irrelevant. They're not going to get these sort of reforms by just asking nicely. They're not going to get these reforms by saying, yes, we agree, capitalism is the only possible system. However, couldn't we do this a bit better? Why do I say this won't work? Because that's what they've been trying. That was Tony Blair's new labor. Uh, that was the modernization of the Social Democratic Party in Germany, which jettisoned Marxism as early as 1959. That's been the project uh, virtually everywhere. And what's been the result? The result has been that the Social Democrats have not surprisingly hemorrhaged members and hemorrhaged votes among their traditional allies, among their traditional base. In the recent European elections, British labor got its lowest vote total since 1918. Now that's pretty hard to do. I mean, you've got name recognition, money, established officers, TV personalities, sympathetic networks, a few papers that support you, like The Guardian. Um, you know, how do you do so badly? Well, you do so badly by year after year having a strategy that says, well, you're going to get screwed, and we're sorry, but we'll try to be nicer about it. We're going to evict you from your house but we'll try not to break your furniture when we're taking it out and put it in the street. Vote for us. Right. Uh, and trying to appeal to peripheral uh, social groups. So, for example, the British Labour Party under Tony Blair thought they could recapture their popular magic by going after fox hunting, thinking that a new generation of animal liberationists would somehow substitute for the industrial unions that used to support them. Not that I'm a fan of fox hunting, mind you, but somehow doesn't seem to have the same uh, cachet as workers of the world unite. You know, leave the little fox alone, but the workers of the world unite. <laughs>